Craig Kokel here, and um, I'm still kind of riding high a little bit from my time in Dallas with the rest of the team at uh, at our reality conference. Two thousand six hundred students. We sold out every single seat in the auditorium, every single seat in the uh, overflow room, and it was just a fabulous experience. Uh, but one of the great things about doing our reality is partnering with Summit Ministries. They have a table there, and we get to promote what they're doing. I love what they're doing. I've uh, been working with them for 25 years, and we have as our guest today Dr. Jeff Meyer. He's the president of Summit Ministries, longtime friend and colleague. And Dr. Jeff, it's great to have you on board today. Welcome. Greg, thanks. Welcome. I'm glad to be part of the show, and thanks for including our summit team. They loved being at the reality conference, and I'm looking forward to a chance when I can actually see that myself in person. Oh, yeah. Well, this was a fabulous uh, series that we're in. That was our fourth time around. We got two more to go. Maybe you'll show up sometime, but it's uh, a we're thrilled to showcase what you're doing. And uh, we're going to talk today about your new book, Truth Changes Everything. How People of Faith Can Transform the World in Times of Crisis. Went through the book uh, thoroughly and, and got a lot of questions for you, and uh, I want people to hear about it. But before we get there, I always like to take this opportunity to showcase what you're doing at Summit, because it's really so important, and I'm glad that my my daughter's almost 16, so in the middle of the summer, we're going we're gonna to shuttle her out there and have two weeks with you guys. So uh, tell us a little bit about what Summit's been doing for so many years and, um, and how people might be involved with that. Well, this is for 60 years now. Summit Ministries has been equipping and supporting a rising generation to embrace God's truth and to champion a biblical worldview. And the part of the program that you've been involved with is our two-week-long conference program. Mm -hmm. So students come 16 to 22 years of age. Just before they head off to college or their career, they learn to... uh, ask really good questions. They get reinforcement in the truth of a biblical worldview from Christian thought leaders who know more than their professors at college will and are more conversant in the key <laughs> issues of the day. So yeah. they they can go off to college with confidence that a biblical worldview is true and that they can mm-hmm. actually be leaders in a culture that is trying to push people of faith to the sidelines. Yeah, it's been great. I think I started there in 2000, no, wait, 1998 now. So that was, uh, what, 25 years ago. Uh, under different leadership then, Doc was on board, and then you took over him for him a number of years ago and handily made the transition and have been uh, piloting that ship for quite a while. Summit has been doing great work. And I actually meet kids all over the country, Dr. Jeff, who um, who have been to Summit and uh, they now they're, I mean, they're grownups. They got their own kids. They're sending to Summit, but they have nothing but good things to say about their experience there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to sending my my uh, my my daughter there, my youngest daughter there during the summer. But our time today, we're going to talk a little bit about your new book, Truth Changes Everything, and um, you know your your book. But hey, basically, let's launch this way. I, I have, whenever I talk to an author. With a great book, I, I have like five different ways I could start the conversation. <laughs> so let, let's just start with your two general goals and um, tell us what the, the two general goals of the book are uh, and why they're so important. Well, the, the first goal is that we want, I want people to understand that there is a battle for truth that's taking place right now, a, a battle between capital T truth, the idea that truth is objectively knowable, not easy to discover, but it is discoverable Mm -hmm. by us, and it will change the way we live. The more Mm -hmm. common view, the one our entire culture has tipped into in the last several years, is what I call the small t truths idea. So Uh whereas we used to seek the truth, now the focus is on speaking your truth. Mm -hmm. And if we don't recover some sense of truth, there's not really hope for us personally. People, psychiatrists will tell you that if you're struggling with a mental health issue, anxiety, or even if an addiction, the first Mm -hmm. step is to grapple with reality as it actually is. And also Mm -hmm. relationally, what psychologists Mm -hmm. call attunement. You cannot relate to another person unless you have a shared understanding of reality. And I think the same thing Mm -hmm. is true for civilization. Mm -hmm. So that's the first big goal. We've got to reclaim capital T truth. But the second thing was, and you've read lots and lots of books on philosophy. You know, Mm -hmm. there are books out there that sell five copies to you, to me, and to a couple of other people (laughs) because their whole goal is just to reinforce all of the complex philosophical arguments for the existence of truth and refute relativism. Um, 
Uh, your book on relativism, by the way, that you published many years ago, is not in that category. It's a brilliantly done book that you did oh, with Frank you. Beckwith. Thanks a lot. Love that. That was book. back in nineteen when we started with uh, Summit. In fact, you guys made a video. Uh, yeah. like a training tool there. We actually filmed it in your basement at Summit. Um, <laughs> Frank and I down there with a real tight camera, you know, so you wouldn't see all the plumbing pipes and everything, like the cobwebs, whatever. But, yeah, thank you for that uh, shout-out. Yeah. Well, the that's, a, that's book, you know, but there, but that's a rare book. Uh, and, and, of course, your tactics book is the number one selling book in our Summit Ministries bookstore. Oh, thank you. But, you know, there are a lot of people out there who think, we well, just have to lock down all the philosophical arguments. But I decided mm -hmm. that my goal will be different for this book. And that I would make as my second goal, not only to elevate truth, but to, to show how the idea that truth is personal. It's not just a set of logical propositions. It's not just a mathematical formula. The truth is a person. It's Jesus. Mm -hmm. And people who believed that Jesus is the truth changed the whole course of history in mm -hmm. science, in art, in medicine, the, the idea of human dignity, politics, justice. And I just wanted to tell those stories because it, it seems like in times of crisis, people get discouraged. They think, ah, mm -hmm. you know, I might as well give up. There's nothing that I can personally do to make a difference. But it was in those times of crisis in history, Greg, that, that these truth tellers stepped up and really did make the difference. And telling mm -hmm. their stories was one of the most exciting projects of my life. Yeah, well, that, I I expected a little different when I uh, read the title in terms of the content. I thought it was going to be another one of those kind of books that talk about truth and a correspondence view and truth matters and Jesus gets in there somewhere. And I know the quality of the things you produce, Jeff, uh, is fabulous, but I thought it was going to go down that road. And you spend a lot of your time telling um, historical accounts. I don't want to say even stories. They're narratives. They're um, anecdotes, so to speak, but of things that you just described. The the Christians who took truth seriously and then took it into their own fields and their own endeavors and transformed the world. And this is a lot of this information is stuff that you know, people don't know about. They just don't realize. Uh, I, I sometimes tell people, and we'll get into this later, but the world is literate because of Christians, missionaries that went out and taught people how to read and write so they could read the, all over the world at great at great um, uh, danger to themselves. But let's, let's work on some of the foundational stuff first, just to, because I think that um, there's so much confusion about this issue. Uh, I love this line that you have in the book, and maybe you can respond to it to help lay a foundation for how we look at all of this. The, you say truth is is hard to find, not because it hides itself, and you made reference to this a moment ago, but because we're looking in the wrong place inside yeah. ourselves. Let's talk yeah. about that a little bit. Well, because you've been out here uh, to our headquarters at of Summit Ministries in Manatee Springs, Colorado, you know that we're right across the street, literally, from Pike National Forest. One million acres of pristine hiking, biking. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's an incredible place. Yeah. But if you go very far out, you might get past some of the more well-marked trails, and you can get lost. So right. what we encourage people to do if they're doing extended trips into the wilderness is to get a topographical map. Those maps show not only the terrain, but they show you different landmarks. And then you bring a compass. So you, with that map and with a compass, you can find where you are and you can figure out how to get where you need to go. But that's only if you're using the compass properly. If you take the compass and say, you know, I always know where I am because I make sure the red needle always points directly toward me, <laughs> right? You, those people are still out there. I mean, you, you're not found. You're more profoundly lost. 91% right. of Americans say they believe the best, the best way to find themselves is to look within themselves. Yeah. And the biblical worldview says, no, the best way is to relate yourself to some objective truth that is knowable. Fixed you know, when you're point. In, in, it's a fixed point of reference. When you're in the wilderness, right. it's magnetic north. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect north. It's not true north, mm -hmm. but it's close enough and that's what we're really looking for. You know, no map mm -hmm. describes the contours uh, exactly. Otherwise, the map would be as big as the area it's trying to describe. Mm -hmm. But you want mm -hmm. to be sure it describes the contours accurately. And so right. that's really the claim that we make about Scripture. You don't have to understand every single thing, but if you have, uh, if you have a sense of what that true north is and then those basic guiding principles, then you can find your way. 
Yeah, I, I've always preferred the metaphor map to describe worldview. I mean, different people use different metaphors, and it's fine. Some people talk about a lens that you look through, but I heard J.P. Moreland say once, well, if all of our lenses are colored and we're looking through colored lenses, then we never really see reality. And he says, I think we actually see reality as much as it as we can are exposed to. But the idea of a map which, which charts the topography of reality, a worldview— well, now you can test it, your worldview, your map of reality against reality to see if it actually tells the truth or not. And this is a big part of what you guys do at Summit is help to show not just what the Christian worldview is, but how it matches the way the world actually is and then can serve to be our guide in that world because we have a reference point outside of ourselves that's accurate to the world. Make sense? That's how that's how we view it. So a Christian worldview then applies to everything. It's not just how you feel about God. It's how you see everything else because mm -hmm. of your relationship with God. Right, and right. at Summit, students are surprised to discover that we not only talk about theology, we also talk about philosophy, ethics, science, right. psychology, sociology, politics, law, economics, history. All of it relates. There's not a mm -hmm. single class you're going to take at a university that is not a, a form of worship to some deity hmm. and gives you the opportunity to understand how that can be a form of worship to God. You know, Nicholas Copernicus, very famous astronomer, mm -hmm. uh, made his astronomical observations initially because he was preparing for a Bible study and wanted to find an accurate <laughs> date for uh, the resurrection of Jesus for Easter. Uh -huh. I didn't it, know that. It's an incre it's it's incredible, but then he realized, oh, well, this whole this whole universe is so much bigger than we realize. The solar system's incredible. It's not only it's it, it's it's not only just out there and interesting to look at, but it's a way for mm -hmm. us to catalog and map and try out all of our various theories of geometry to see if they match up to reality. But, mm -hmm. but he said, look, look, when you when you're involved in science, you're actually involved in a form of worship to the Most High. Mm -hmm. uh, now, people have false worship, and we also talk about those worldviews at Summit because we want students to be alert and mm -hmm. not susceptible to them. You know, what I think about truth, um, you know, in a certain sense, um, this concept is really stri simple, straightforward, commonsensical, down-to-earth, because we and we use it all the time. We talk about, well, you know, uh, the, the train is late, or the plane is late, or it's leaving, or whatever, really? And we think, really? And all we're saying is, is that true? Is that the case? But there's been such a transformation, it seems to me, in the culture about um, our understanding of truth that has had a real impact on us. And and I want you to talk about that a little bit. I know that you've done some recent polling with the McLaughlin and Associates, uh, and, and Barn has done his deal, and the um, Arizona Christian University is do their thing every year. Tell us what you're discovering about the shifting understanding of truth um, in our culture, and especially with young people, the people that you deal with on a regular basis at Summit. Well, we found in in the polling, and it's we don't we're not a polling company at Summit. We train mm -hmm. young adults to be right. leaders, but we do polling. We have a great polling partner, McLaughlin and Associates. They're also the polling partner of you know people like Benjamin Netanyahu and and uh, a lot of others. But they help us understand the pulse of mm -hmm. of the culture, and the pulse of the culture right now is that the, the young. It seems that the younger people are, the more they believe that truth is up to the individual mm -hmm. rather than that truth is objectively discoverable. Mm -hmm. uh, so th somebody said postmodernism is dead. That is a premature announcement. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Postmodernism is now fully flourishing in the culture because people believe that words don't describe reality, words create reality. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about things, we self-construct our own reality, and that's all we can know to be true. Yeah. Of course, you know, you have to assume that somebody actually figured that out, right? Yeah, uh, right. It, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is that, well, this is the, in a certain sense, the conflict of that notion where on the one hand, and it, it, you know, I, I, I don't know who put it this way, but uh, I mean, it's the, the view I hold that when it gets right down, push comes to shove, everybody is a common sense realist, you know, and there, and whether it's about general things or it's about morality, whatever, but, but for whatever reason, and we, we know about the reasons for that, the fall and rebellion and all kinds of stuff. We were just reading with a caller 
last hour when I did a show, and it was, uh, you know, Romans 1. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. There are things that people come up with that they, they go along with because of other motives. In this postmodern deal, it's like it's really nice if, if, you don't, if you're not beholden to God or anyone else, you're only beholden to your own beliefs. But it, but it's it really has, you know, gotten its talons into the youth. How much are you experiencing? And I know with Summit, you've got a cross section of Christian young people that's very different than the standard church group. They're very committed characteristically. A lot of them homeschool, sharp group of people. I mean, I always got to be on my toes when I'm standing before a summit audience. But uh, have you seen, uh, Jeff, a um, a significant impact of this cultural view of truth that even with the Christians that you're encountering? Uh, no question. Summit? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think we're seeing the fruit of it now. 75% of the young adults we work with say they do not have a sense of purpose that gives them meaning in life. More than wow. 50% say they regularly struggle with anxiety and depression. Huh. A third of them say they don't know what gender they are. So it, it, the confusion is now complete. And so young adults are coming. We ask them, bring all of your hard questions with you. And one of their right. fundamental questions is, why does any of this even matter? Can I even really know anything at all? You know, the, when, when students used to come to Summit Ministries, uh, you know, I'd been an instructor long before I became president. Right, right. And students would ask questions like, on sexuality, for example, they would ask questions like, uh, well, how far is too far, right? Uh -huh. That's the main question they were asking. Uh, this last summer, I had a student, one, a very bright student, sit down with me at lunch, and he said, Can, I've got my list of questions, just like you said. I'm not sure where I am with God, but uh, I just, you know, can I ask you a question? And his first question to me was, what is it, aside from consent, that should govern my sexual ethic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm. man, that is a very different question. Yeah. I mean, there, he's not asking... Mm -hmm. He's not asking the There's, question, should I have sex? He's yeah. asking, you know, is there anything outside of I'm willing, the other person's willing, therefore it's okay. Right. Right. Uh, and, and, and he's confused. He's not uh, fulfilled in his relationships, mm -hmm. but he can't figure out why, because he's, he's, he's grappling with a wrong understanding of reality. And, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned Romans 1, Scripture, throughout Scripture, calls this uh, deception. It's self-deception. It's being double-minded, James, mm -hmm. is, is, is the way James put it. Mm -hmm. Well, you have mentioned before, I think I've heard you say this about that the cultures, uh, that somebody's going to disciple your kids. And uh, the culture is doing the biggest job because they have a hold of our kids the most time, whether it's public schools or TV or movies or radio or music, whatever, they're pounding these messages in. And I actually was a little bit surprised with the numbers you gave if they reflected even the young, the numbers of the young people that you're encountering at Summit, because like I said, they're cut above, you know, and they come from a very much more characteristically, a much more well-educated, um, theologically educated and motivated uh group of people than, say, the standard church crowd, but it just shows how powerful, how, uh, how uh, aggressive the, and corrosive the culture is on the thinking of our kids when Christian kids raise questions like that. We're glad we're, they're raising them and that you're there to answer them, but when they're honest, these are the kinds of questions. It's not like, like you said, how far is too far? There isn't a too far anymore. It's not even on the map. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what, if you, if there is no ultimate meaning, if truth is not discoverable, then what am I going to do when I encounter problems? I am my own God. Well, that's, that's pretty right. frightening because I'm lost. I don't uh -huh. know where I'm going. I don't mm -hmm. know what's wrong with me, but I know I feel anxious all of the time or depressed. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. students are, are telling me these days. And, and so to understand that they can, they can go back to Scripture, have a foundation, and then for them to realize that truth exists, but it's not just the way the Greeks talked about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the Greeks had this term for the obviousness of reality. If you step off mm -hmm. a cliff, you're going down. Even if you mm -hmm. feel strong feelings of upness, you're going down. Mm -hmm. that, that word for the obviousness of reality is logos. And in John 1... Scripture says, in the beginning was the Word. Well, that word for word in Greek is logos. 
the scriptures transforming that philosophical concept to say that word is actually a person. He's the one who created the world. Nothing was made apart from him. In him is life, and that right. life is the light of men. Now, so this is a real important concept because I, I this, it's, it's uh, in Scripture, it seems like the concept of truth is played in both directions, you know, in a very creative way. One is, obviously, when it says, thy word is truth, um, the, the the writers are referring to the propositional nature of Scripture that you can count on it to tell you reality, uh, a, speak accurately about reality. Okay, but then it talks about the logos and the logos being a person, and then truth is personalized. So we have these these two different elements that are going. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship? In in what sense do we say that Jesus is truth? Uh, that isn't to disqualify the other notion of truth, but how do those play off of each other? I'm curious about your your response to that. Well, there the word for truth in Greek, and the Koine Greek is fascinating to study. I would encourage mm-hmm. people to get a Strong's Concordance and uh, a Bible dictionary and to look mm-hmm. up some of these words, because sometimes in English they don't come across with quite the power that they do you know, in the Old Testament in Hebrew or in the New Testament mm-hmm. in Greek. But in Greek, the, the primary word for truth that is used is aletheia. It means reality. Mm-hmm. So Jesus is, is saying two things. Uh, I, I'm going to bring the light so that you can see reality, and I am that reality. I am mm-hmm. the way, the truth, and the life, John mm-hmm. 14, 6. Uh, You can see it in how Jesus treats Scripture. You know, Jesus doesn't say, it used to be said, or it was written. He always says, it is written. Mm. The the idea that Scripture is actually alive and present Mm. with us is an important part of Jesus' teaching. And and people had a very hard time grasping that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Apostle Paul, Peter, actually all of the rest of the New Testament bears out the nature of that testimony and how it applies to everything else. Yeah, I, I think one of the keys here, it's so important, and it's manifest in everything you guys do at Summit, is that we're not just talking about propositions, we're not just talking about facts. Facts are critical, they're foundational, but the facts are integrated in that personal relationship, that friendship with God manifest in the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, I, I want to... Um, You've already hinted at this a little bit, but I wanted you to address it specifically. What would you say to Christians who believe that truth is somehow lost? It's it's, uh, and I think there's, as you expressed, there's a lot of anguish out there. There's a lot of darkness that people are feeling. This uncertainty, even if they are somehow committed to Christ, but still the culture has shaken them up so much with regards to confidence regarding truth that they're, they're thinking, look, there's no hope for this generation, though. What's your response to that, Jeff? Well, you know, Satan in Scripture, uh, in the Hebrew, it's, actually, it's literally Satan in mm-hmm. Hebrew, and it means adversary. Uh, it is the one who lies to us about the actual state of things. Mm-hmm. And, and the, this, this is, a, is, a, is an existence. There is actually, a, you know, there, there's actually sort of a personality behind this. This is not just, oh, yeah. you know, a rock falling on you. Wow, that's a terrible accident. No, this mm-hmm. is on purpose, right. that there is a deception that is ongoing, and that's that's one of the key teachings in Scripture. You've got to free ourselves mm-hmm. from that deception. The Colossians, of lies. Uh, that's right. Colossians 2.8 talks about that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.5, 2 uh, Corinthians mm-hmm. 10.5, I'm sorry, talks about that. We've got to recognize that this is a battle and that it's 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 real. So right. I, I think hopelessness is one of the it, it is it's both a cause and an effect of the kind of culture in in which we live, where people mm-hmm. see that things aren't going the right way. I mean, how could it possibly mm-hmm. be that our culture seems so decrepit sometimes when sixty eight percent of people claim to be Christians? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, so it's what we, a head shaker. I agree with you. It is. Well, what, one thing we found, Greg, is that we st- in our polling that we did with the McLaughlin Group, and we do this every month. Mm-hmm. So we've got dozens and dozens oh. of questions that we've polled on now. Mm-hmm. And one of the key findings that I was shocked by, we asked people, well, if you know the truth, why don't you say anything? And it turns out half the people who say they know the truth will never say anything, and they give us three reasons. Number one, they're afraid they'll be canceled. Number two, they're afraid they'll offend somebody. And number three, they don't know what to say. 
Mm. Well, if you've got if you've got half the people who know the truth who just won't say anything, they won't live mm. as if the truth is really true because they're afraid. Mm-hmm. Then it is always possible that a tiny, tiny minority of the population can control the narrative for everybody right. else. And that's what's happening. Um, you have a section in there in your book, and the book, just for the record, the truth changes everything, how people of faith can transform the world in times of crisis. Dr. Jeff Myers, the author, uh, Baker Bookhouse is your publisher for this. That was the publisher for Relativism uh, for me back that my own first title with Frank Beckwith. Um, so since there's this kind of anguish or angst or whatever about the possibility of knowing truth, even among Christians who hold on to truth in some sense, but with maybe a high degree of uncertainty and therefore the angst, um, you talk in your book some of the reasons we can believe or be confident that truth can be known. Can you offer some of those thoughts here? What are some of the tools that help us out? And then we're going to get into some of the stories that you talk about of the way people influenced uh, who are followers of Christ and uh, believers pursue truth and have a dramatic influ- influence on the world. How do we know truth? Well, there are a lot of good books that talk about this, so I just tried to summarize. I didn't want this mm-hmm. to be the main focus of the book. But uh, one, one thing is that truth rises. If someone says there is no truth, then they're proclaiming the existence of a truth. Right. It's not That's even right. possible to say truth is not knowable without mm-hmm. proclaiming that there is a truth that you can know. Right. And so it, it could just be a trick of language, but it does seem that truth rises whenever we try to even deny its existence. The second thing mm-hmm. is there's a, there's a knowable relationship between words and the things and ideas to which they refer. If I talk mm-hmm. about a chair, the word chair is not the same thing as a chair, mm-hmm. but we can, ha- we can reliably uh, use those words because the things and ideas to which we refer have essences that project themselves back to us. So mm-hmm. we can, if somebody says there's no such thing as truth and, and uh, people who proclaim truth always do things that are unjust, well, wait a second, mm-hmm. what is justice? If there's no uh, such sure. thing as, if there's no such thing as truth, there's no such thing as mm-hmm. justice. Justice right. is just another word. But if uh-huh. words can reliably and knowably refer to things, then we can yeah. have a conversation. If someone yeah. says, I disagree with you, then they're, they're actually saying that they believe there is some kind of a truth that is knowable right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't even bother to say, because words have no meaning. They wouldn't be able to disagree, because to disagree is to say that you're wrong and I'm right, kind of thing, and that's trades on the notion of truth. Yeah, uh, Right, and even if they're just saying, I have a different perspective, and I need you to hear it, Mm -hmm. they're still saying, I have a perspective of something. Yeah, that's right. So, So ideas and things and the relationship of words, that's knowable. A third thing is the relationship between facts and opinions. Uh, you know, a lot of people today in the postmodern world are saying there really aren't any facts. It's mm-hmm. all opinion. It's all perception. Even mm-hmm. the facts of the physical world, time, mm-hmm. space, distance, and so forth, are all relative to our own perceptions. Mm-hmm. But we know this isn't actually the case. If, if I were to say, hey, did you know that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level? You might say, well, it depends on atmospheric conditions, but you wouldn't mm-hmm. say, well, that's your opinion, mm-hmm. right? Or it's same with historical facts. Yeah. When I say Martin Luther King was shot on April 4th, 1968, it wouldn't be appropriate for someone to say, well, maybe in your culture that's true, but not in mine. Mm-hmm. So we know, we know that there, there are these facts that exist. Well, then what about moral facts? And that's where people start to say, okay, well, there are no moral facts, just opinions. But Mm -hmm. we know the difference between caring for an animal and torturing an animal. And we know that it's not just a a word choice, that there is an actual difference between those things. Most people know that. The big thing for me, and and I'll say this because it's a little bit of a shocker, but there's a point here, and that is, as a Christian apologist, I love the problem of evil. And the reason I love it is not because I love evil, but the problem of evil is something that everybody's aware of, no matter where they lived or when they lived. And uh, the complaint that they have is that evil is real and objective. 
So if morals are just like you described, many people will say, just relative to one's own experience, there can't be a problem of evil. There can only be some things people like and other people don't like, and, you know, that's all you can say about it. So uh, I, what occurred to me also in a very simple way is this, you can actually test the world to find out whether your views are true. You got on board here because you got an email that had a link, a Zoom link that you could click so there was an implicit claim there. You push this button and click it, and you'll see Kokel's face here before too long, <laughs> and we'll have a chat. And when you pushed it, there I was, which means that your belief about the link was actually true. It was accurate. Mm. And these are the kinds of things we do all the time, and we don't even think about it. In fact, if we could not know what was true, we'd be dead in a day, you know, because our life depends on getting certain things accurately in the world. So let's take a shift here. You start out with, um, um, you start out talking about the plague, okay? <laughs> uh, and you use that as a motif kind of to get into this, this broader issue of truth. And tell us a little bit about why you use that um, as a launch for this discussion in your book. Greg, I've had a lot of people say our times of crises are worse than any crises that have ever happened in the past. Mm -hmm. There's no hope for us now. There might have been hope in the past, but they just didn't have it as bad as we do. So I thought, mm. no, let's go back to a time in history when people really were in a rough spot. Yeah, Let's go back to the Black Death in the mm -hmm. mid-1300s, the first time the plague struck in a massive way in, that we have recorded history for in Europe— a third to a half of the people in Europe died in the most gruesome, painful way imaginable. Wow. Okay? That's worse than the political struggles that we have in our time. That's worse yeah. than the cultural struggles we have in our time. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what, what happened in the aftermath of that? Because if there ever was a time in history where you, you might have understood if people said, look, God has clearly abandoned us, we're going to abandon him, that might have been it. But that isn't what happened. Mm -hmm. What actually happened is there were Jesus followers who pressed in rather than try to escape. So mm -hmm. I tell some of their stories. Catherine of Siena is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. She's, she said, I'm going toward the sick. And everybody said, you got to get out. I mean, we're leaving. Anybody who has money or connections is leaving. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm not leaving. I'm going toward the sick. Mm -hmm. Why? They asked her. And she said, because Jesus sits with the suffering, and I want mm -hmm. to be with Jesus. It was very simple for her, that mm -hmm. Jesus is the truth, and I'm going, I want to be with Jesus. And, mm -hmm. and out of that really came the whole system of medical care that we, that we think of as important today. But it wasn't mm -hmm. only that. It was in economics. It was in science. In all of these different areas, people said, Jesus is not separated from us. He's right here suffering with us. You mm -hmm. see massively the change in art. I mean, you can walk into, you know, the Academia Gallery in Florence, for example, and you can see the difference between the paintings from the 1200s and the paintings from the 1300s. Hmm. Because it came, it's like life really came to life. Hmm. The, the person of Christ really came to a, a, a whole new level of... Uh, wow, we don't just like Jesus. We need Jesus. We love Jesus. It's because of Jesus that we have eternal uh, salvation. And so therefore we can go into the world. And if we die, we go to be with Jesus. But if we live, then we get to glorify him and bring blessing and mm. flourishing to the nations. It is yeah. astounding the changes yeah. that occurred. And that, that really brings us to the heart, I think, of the book. You lay the foundation about, uh, about truth that we've been talking about so far, but then you go into to all these examples of how Jesus' followers have radically transformed different areas of culture over the years, starting way back then. You gave one brief example of the plague and health. Um, I'd like to kind of take each of those individually and probe a little deeper, because to me, this is the encouragement that the book provides for the average Christian person who is feeling like the whole culture is against them. And I was just talking to friends whose kids are getting canceled left and right because they're just yeah. standing up for truth. And uh, and the it, it, it's like the, the sky is falling. That's easy to think. But what you describe here is when the sky was falling in many other periods of history, 
Christian stepped up and stepped forward right in the middle of the skyfall and made a radical difference. And you just mentioned the plague as one example. Do you have more examples just about health in that broader category that you want to speak to? Uh, I would I would love to. I, I, I would just go back to the idea of human dignity. Most mm-hmm. of the people who are listening to us right now just assume, even though we don't always act as if other people have value, and that's on yeah. us, but we know that they do, that every mm-hmm. person has value. Well, where did we get that idea? Because I majored in political science as an undergraduate. I was taught that that idea came from the Greeks and Romans. Mm-hmm. But my deep study of the Greeks and the Romans and studying philosophy showed me that they were haughty, elite-driven cultures. Sure, you had value in Rome if you were a majority culture property-owning male. Other than that, no value. You had no guarantees, right. no security. Who, who brought that? Well, it was Jesus' followers who believed that Genesis 1, we should actually take seriously, that God created us in his image and in his mm-hmm. likeness, and then made us male and female. All of that matters. So the idea of human dignity, mm-hmm. secular culture can't grapple with that. You know, Marvin Minsky, the, one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence, called human beings meat machines. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's consistent with what I, I've been to Silicon Valley. I've met with executives there, and they talk about hardware, software, and wetware. You know, you're just a bag of meat that <laughs> mm-hmm. buys stuff. That's your only value. Mm-hmm. But, but biblically speaking, it was Christians who stepped in, not just in medical care, but in all these different areas. And, and you know, uh, Thomas Aquinas, some people like him, some people don't like him. Most people don't even know who he was, but probably the, one of the most important philosophers ever to live. Mm-hmm. Right. And he, you know, he developed and talked about this idea of the soul, which we see in Genesis one twenty seven, or I'm sorry, Genesis chapter two, verse seven, where scripture says that God made man a living soul, a nephesh in Hebrew, that there's something different about the man from all of the other creatures. He's an individual. He knows that he's an individual. He knows that he's separate from all other creation. He has a substance that is continuous. You know, if his like I had my appendix out when I was a kid, I wasn't less Jeff. My mm-hmm. cells change over every seven years. You know, right. I can't. I can't say I've I didn't commit a crime. I've been watching you change over the years, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> You've been watching me, but you're still Jeff. If the police knocked on the door and said, "Hey, man, you committed a crime seven years ago," I can't say, "Well, that wasn't me," just yeah. because my cells have all changed over. Right. So right. my my substance is continuous. I have mental states that I know are not just physical. All of those things about the existence of the soul that Aquinas talked about are really significant. And, mm-hmm. and the, the basic response of the secular culture today in academia is just ignore it. Just right. ignore it. We don't even talk about the soul anymore, which is weird. Like in psychology, the word psyche is the Greek word for soul. Yeah, yeah. Soulology yeah. is what the psych- psychology is supposed to be about. But nobody wants to believe in the soul. So yeah, instead, they talk about the self, self actualization, yeah. self concept, and, and so forth. So if but we reclaim. Yeah, there's uh, just a thought here. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. There's there's subtle ways that they give themselves away though on these things because when, and this is where it goes back to my comment that we're all really common sense realists when it gets when push comes to shove because you hear people on the abortion side say it's my body, my choice. In other words, they own their body, therefore they can make the choices about their body. Notice how they subtly distinguish between their body and themselves which is a legitimate yeah. distinction when you think of the soul versus the body. Uh, or when a woman says, uh, I am a woman trapped... No, I, when, a, when a man says, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. Well, wait a minute. That itself presumes kind of a dualistic understanding of human beings, that you and your body are not exactly the same, you know? So what I'm saying, when they're not defending turf... And th- mm. then they're talking about zoology, you know, mach- wet machines defending turf, but when they're not defending turf and they're just speaking matter-of-factly and commonsensically, sensibly about the nature of being human and the nature of reality, these other things that come out are very consistent with a Christian understanding of the world. Even, even human value, you know, we got human rights. What's human rights all about? Injustice yeah. and all that. That just presumes a moral foundation. So and there's we, a way we, in which reality yeah. is on our side, you know, we can leverage it that way. Go ahead. Jim. There's Sorry. no question. And, and, and if you look, and even in, uh, rights is a good example, and, and we can go there. 
the very idea of justice that we take for granted today as a legacy of Jesus followers. Mm -hmm. You go back to people like Hugo Grotius, a child prodigy, went to college at age 11, had his doctorate by age 15, became the primary writer on international law. In fact, he wrote books on two different things. He wrote books on international law and he wrote books on apologetics. And Mm -hmm. his, his thinking about international law became the basis of the thinking of John Locke, John Mm -hmm. Locke became the basis of a lot of uh, the American founders thinking about how you put together a republic that moves toward rights, even if we can't secure them right now, Mm -hmm. uh, that it moves toward greater rightfulness through Mm -hmm. time. Uh, All of that, you know, these were Jesus followers doing all of Mm -hmm. this work. So this is, uh, I've got my own list of uh, of things here, uh, and we're kind of jumping all around. So you just touched on politics a little bit, you know, a lot of... A lot of Christians think that we don't need to get involved in politics, and they anathematize it. But what you're saying is the politics that is really the polis, the foundation of the community that governs us and protects us, has the things that we value, like liberty and justice, etc. These have their roots in a Christian way of understanding reality. Say some more about that. Yes, well, a Christian way of understanding reality, and therefore a Christian way of placing uh, human beings inside of that reality in their their appropriate place. Mm -hmm. So so there are a lot of really good examples. One of the stories I I really enjoy telling, and and it's in the book, is of Samuel Rutherford, who was a Scottish Presbyterian pastor. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called Lex Rex, which in Latin means law is king. Right. Up until that time, people believed rex lex, the king is the law. Right. Whatever the king does is automatically right. If, some, if the king kills somebody, it's because that person needed killing. That's just the mm-hmm. way it is. You can't stop mm-hmm. him. He gets, to, he gets to decide. He's the natural heir of Adam. And Rutherford said, uh, he, you know, and it's not just a short, the title's cool and short, but the book is complicated. Right. Uh, in fact, the subtitle's 136 words. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but he not says... Not exactly in, marketable in today's it's market. Not, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't, yeah, it's not a bestseller anymore. But it, it is worth going back to read, or at least understand the basic concept, because he said the king is the natural of Ad, heir of mm-hmm. Adam, and so are all the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Well, the king of England at the time was in an insecure position, Charles II, he tried to have Rutherford killed. Rutherford mm-hmm. actually died before his soldiers, the king's soldiers, arrived to arrest him. Huh. And uh, he said on his deathbed, I've been, been summoned by a higher authority. <laughs> and uh, and like the king. fish to fry, right? <laughs> that's right, yeah. Well, the king, you know, he was so mad, he said, Well, dig up his bones and burn them. You right. know, uh, but, but the horse was out of the barn at that point, Greg. Mm-hmm. You could no longer go back. The king was subject to the law. Do we respect mm-hmm. kingship? Yes. Scripture tells us that we are to respect the office. But that right. does not mean that the person holding that office is unquestionably right. Mm-hmm. So the American founders found a way to put together these institutions, divide them so that no one person can have complete control mm-hmm. uh, based on their understanding of sin nature, based on their way of way, the ways they saw Moses do this in what they called the Hebrew Republic. Mm-hmm. And they put this all together and said, you know, we, it's not perfect the way it is. There are a lot of things that need to be remedied, but this system will allow us to remedy them. As one historian, Wilfred McClay, put it, uh, they built the Constitution with the crooked timber of humanity in mind. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a good thing they did, because they took into consideration the sinfulness of man, and so we have balance of power. But So we have Jesus' followers that shape our understanding of human value, and that, uh, sh- and and also that has an impact on how we serve sick people. So they change our understanding about taking care of sick people, and that resulted in <laughs> modifications uh, in medicine, etc. You talked about politics right just now, and how the law is king, not the king is law. Um, what about education? In general, I mean, this touches on it, obviously, what we've been talking about so far. Well, <clears throat> if you look back in Scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6, key passage on education. Right. Uh, we, we've heard it before. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all of your soul, all of your might. The word for might there is mailed. In Hebrew, it means very. Love God with all of your very. In other words, mm-hmm. love God with everything. everything. And then Scripture says... And you shall teach these principles to your children. 
when you sit in your house and when you lie down and when you walk by the way, all, all of the time. And, and so of that passage, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who was a British Jewish leader, very well respected, said, Moses understood that if you want to make a difference for a year, you plant rice. If you want to make a difference for a decade, you plant a tree. Mm-hmm. If you want to make a difference for posterity, you educate a child. Mm-hmm. And the term education is important here. It's, not, it's education, not just schooling. The root word of education is duke, which means to lead. Educe in Latin means to lead out of. So you're a, mm-hmm. there is ignorance. We're leading people out of ignorance toward something. If you don't believe there's truth, you can school a person, but you cannot educate them. Hmm. So the innovations in education really came about through Christians. And weirdly, I trace it back to an Irish monk named Columbanus, who, you know, has had his brother monks build him a boat made of animal skins, no oars, no sail. And he just floated away. He, you know, <laughs> got, Jesus said, go into all the world and I'm going, you know, he just floated off. He went, yeah. off he went. and he landed in great Britain. He, he ended up converting people, building a monastery, collecting a library. The library became a university and he did this mm. all throughout Europe. In fact, if you look at the, the, the main institutions, the top 15 universities in the world were started. Mm-hmm. And this is a claim by Jay Warner Wallace, who's a mutual friend of ours and right. someone I know you've had on your show. But the top 15 universities in the world were all started by Jesus followers That's right. because they wanted to glorify God by knowing things, because they believed that the knowing of things delighted God. It delighted him when we discovered aspects of his invisible nature and allowed us to give glory to him. Science did not rise in rebellion against God, as the Enlightenment myth says. It rose to applaud him. I I remember a book, I'm trying to think of the author, I'm sure you're familiar with it, How the Irish Saved Civilization. Um, Yeah, Thomas Cahill. Yeah, Thomas Cahill, because here, I mean, it wasn't just the Irish guys, it was the Irish Christians that were domiciling all the great books and the writings and everything while things were being destroyed in Europe because of this this love for education, the love for knowledge that the, the Christians had that... Uh, you're familiar with the book, apparently, but it's a, it's a yes. great... Uh, Thomas Cahill, well, I remember that. You know, in, in, in the book, True Changes Everything, I tell the story of John Wycliffe, which I, I just think is wonderful. He was also a professor at Oxford University, which was started as a monastery, Hmm. And he decided uh, the Bi- people need to hear the Bible in English. It was a very dangerous thing to do. People thought yeah, at that right. time Latin was the best language. If you put That's the Bible right. in English, it's like adding curse words every third or fourth word. It vulgarizes mm-hmm. it. It's not mm-hmm. only wrong, it's not only disrespectful to God, it'll earn you the death penalty. Mm-hmm. But he decided to take the risk because he said Moses heard from God in his own language. The disciples heard from Jesus in their own language. People today need to hear from God in their own language. The problem was their language was not well-formed. There was no standard English until Mm. Wycliffe translated the Bible into English, including adding words to the dictionary. There were 1,100 words in English that are used for the first time in the Wycliffe Bible. He standardized the English language. Well, then the English language then changed the world. Uh, This is nothing against people for whom English is not a first language or who don't speak English, but English is the number one trade language in the world. It is the Mm -hmm. common use of English that has allowed the rise of prosperity. For the first time in history, more than half the people in the world live in middle class or higher homes where they actually have some financial stability. All of that came about because of trade, which came about because people could communicate with one another, right. which came about because That's a guy amazing. named John Wycliffe said people That's need right. to hear from God in their own language. So we, we got about uh, a little less than 10 minutes to go, and I, I want to touch uh, a, a little bit on the science issue because this you speak about this quite a bit in your book, how Jesus' followers have changed our understanding of science, and you made a quick reference to it a little bit early earlier. Um, Expand on that a little bit, because this is an area where the rank and file think uh, there's a great conflict, a conflict between science and religion, or science and faith, or or however they want to characterize it. Tell us about that. Very bright people have said and continue to say that the battle is really between science and religion. Uh, That's a myth that comes from the Enlightenment. But a lot of people believe it. um, Stephen Hawking believed it. He said there is a battle between science and religion, and science will win because it works. The battle is mischaracterized. Uh, I quoted Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs earlier. 
Sachs also said this. He said, science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts things together to see what they mean. Hmm. And from the earliest times, even people in the scriptures who looked up at the heavens and explored the heavens, they saw the glory of God. They saw this wasn't just a cold vacuum. There was meaning behind it. Mm-hmm. And the meaning-making nature of human beings is actually what caused the rise of science. So Rodney Stark uh, unfortunately passed away recently. Oh, I didn't a, know that. Yeah, a I brilliant a historian and sociologist yeah. at Baylor University. His books are brilliant. Mm-hmm. And he was able to demonstrate that of the 52 individuals whose inventions and discoveries are responsible for the rise of modern science, only one of them was an atheist. Only one. Mm -hmm. So the idea that there's a battle between science and faith somehow is not actually correct. It was people of faith who form science. Mm -hmm. Uh, An easy book, uh, a fair, well, some of these books aren't that easy, but an easier book, an older one, if you can find it, is The Soul of Science. Oh, yeah. By Charles Thaxton and Nancy Th- Piercy. Thaxton, right, right, right. It's a mm-hmm. wonderful book. And, and I've repeated their points in several of my books because I wasn't sure if people could still get that book. But uh, they, they have pointed out that, look, look, there are several things that are really consistent with a biblical worldview and not with other worldviews mm-hmm. that are the basis of science. For example, the fact that the world uh, appears to be designed. We can observe it, and our observations make sense because we're sense makers, and the universe is designed to make sense. Mm -hmm. It is rationally intelligible because it was made by someone who is rationally intelligent. Mm -hmm. And and they continued on. If if the world is stable, if you do an experiment at time A, an experiment at time B, then you're actually experimenting in the same world. This was not, you know, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus denied that idea. You, you can never step in the same river twice. You know, there's, right. nothing per, there's nothing permanent that allows you to make reasonable observations. Mm-hmm. Well, the Greeks, if they had followed that train of thought, would have completely given up on science. Aristotle, you know, we think, oh, Aristotle is the guy who founded science. The guy never observed anything. He said men had more teeth than women. And is <laughs> because it just made sense to him. Men are bigger, therefore their mouths are bigger, therefore they have more teeth. He never uh-huh. bothered to count. Uh-huh. It was it was Jesus' followers who said, you know, if God made the world this way, we're obligated to understand it. Mm-hmm. That our science classes that we take, I mean, we may not like them, but we're it's worship. We're involved mm-hmm. in worship of the you Almighty. Know, that's a, that point that you made about worship, I think that was also made uh, by by Newton. You know, in his Principia, you know, he's talking about the thing that motivates him to discover the world is discovering God and That's right. and and uh, and loving Him and, and it's an, His science was an act of worship. Um, we we just got a few minutes here that are left, and and I want to key in on some final thoughts here. In the book, you write that Christians today can breathe life into others' yeah. conversations, uh, to in, life into others through conversations. Talk a little bit about that, uh, Jeff. Well, Greg, and I. Uh, our, you, you and I have been on parallel tracks on this, which has, has mm-hmm. been wonderful. Your book, Tactics, mm-hmm. illustrates this point. Your new book that's coming out, Street Smarts, I've just been reading it. You sent me a copy. I printed that's it out. Right. I'm reading it. I'm still waiting uh, on your endorsement, Jeffrey. <laughs> uh, okay. You, you, you know gave me a few guy. more days. I'm taking every last minute. No, uh, but, God bless you, brother. Uh, you. Uh, but here, here is the, here's the thing. It is through mm-hmm. conversation that we can bring truth to others. I try Mm -hmm. to get our staff here at Summit Ministries to picture the DNA of influence as two strands, truth and relationship, like a DNA double helix. Mm. Oh, and and then the connecting nucleotides. Say that again. Say that again. The the, the double helix. The DNA of influence influence. is two strands, truth and relationship. Oh, excellent. So just picture a DNA double helix. It twists together those connecting nucleotides, that's what that's our goal. We our it's a goal stairway every day. too. When you think of it, there's another aspect of it. It's a, a good, great there. point. There's it looks like a twisty ladder. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. But we well, every day we're connecting truth and relationship for people. If you want to, let's say you think you might go to war with another country, well, you don't just send them long letters about why you shouldn't go to war. You send somebody. Ambassador. You send an ambassador. Right. You you incarnate the values of your country and try to coordinate with the other country to find out their values and see if there's any common ground that can avoid catastrophe. 
And, and really, that's what Jesus did when you quoted this earlier from John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we observed his glory. The glory is the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Mm -hmm. uh, that the incarnation is, is um, powerful and profound, and it's also an example for us. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what else to do, just move closer rather than farther away from mm -hmm. personal conversations. Don't let social media do your dirty work. You move into the conversation. Have the conversations. Have mm -hmm. the have the talk, and you can just be curious, ask questions, you know, tell me more about that. It's my favorite question, yeah. tell me yeah. more about that. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> I, I just said recently over the weekend in Dallas, I said, uh, when I was talking about the tactics in a breakout session, I said, when you start engaging people like that, you're going to find out that a couple of things. One is that people are not as scary as you thought. I mean, we're like grasshoppers at our own site, right? Like the Book of Numbers and the the spies yeah. that went out to Israel. And, but uh, but when we start talking with people, we realize they're they're not as scary as we thought. And sometimes we learn that they're not as bright as we thought. You know, it isn't that they're stupid, but sometimes we elevate uh, what, what their intelligence, and it you know puts us out of the running. And uh, yeah, you... that engagement is. Yeah, Go ahead, that's Jay. right. We don't have to be scared. We don't have to be uh, afraid of people. And, and you know, it's, it's not that people aren't smart. It's they're distracted. There's a lot of stuff to pay attention to. You got your yeah. job, then you got to go home. You got to make a meal. Then you want to try to relax a little bit. So you watch some TV and it's just, it, uh, you know, life's complicated. Life's hard. Uh, so, so engaging people in conversation, just that simple act shows Jesus to them. That's right. You you mentioned as you polled people, you said afraid and afraid twice. They're afraid of, uh, they're going to get canceled. They're afraid that they're going to maybe not answer a question or whatever it was. But there are two fears there. And uh, I think the action like this, following the things that you describe in your book, being a follower of Jesus who's willing to engage and ask the questions and to um, take the truth and live that truth out, uh, that's the key to making a difference, even a very, very hostile hostile culture. Jeff, very quickly, 20 seconds, tell us how we can get people listening can get a hold of your book and also find out more about Summit. If you just Google the title of the book, Truth Changes Everything, it's available wherever you like to buy books. Mm -hmm. But if you want to come to summit.org, in fact, you can sign up for our newsletter there. We'll connect with you once a week, tell you all the things that we're focused on. But we really want to get young adults in this program because they are the future. They're 15% yeah. of the population. They're 100% of the future. And we can influence them for the Lord and to be strong and courageous in this time. That's a summit.org, a fabulous organization. Um, Truth Changes Everything, How People of Faith Can Transform the World in Times of Crisis. Dr. Jeff Myers. Jeff, thanks so much for your time here with us. Thanks, Greg.